Hello and good morning, Steve. How are you doing today? I'm not doing too bad. How about yourself? Absolutely fantastic and very excited to have a conversation with you. And and the reason being is because oh, I, I love this book cover. Oh, my God. I want to talk about that first. That that It just reminds me so much of my childhood. It reminds me of my journey of collecting baseball cards. It's There's just so much here that captures the imagination. Well, it's uh, the work of a really talented graphic artist named Tracy Copes, who I've worked with on a couple of books. And uh, she's just, uh, she does... She, she reads the text and she comes up with exactly what I had in mind. So, what's really interesting is that on the you know part of the title in the book, a tale of baseball cards, average players. We don't hear much about the average players, and you really do open up a door for baseball fans to step inside, saying, "Yeah, why don't we hear about the average players?" Well, you know, it's that's a that's a great question, and it's exactly why I decided to roll the dice and and do this book because there's so many biographies done on, you know, the superstars, so the Willie Mazes, the Mickey Mantles. And I got into this because of Danny O'Connell's baseball card, which I kept coming across when I was a kid back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I got intrigued by who this guy was because he was so, you know, he was a faceless guy as far as I was concerned. There were so many other players that were just names. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started looking into his life, I found out that being a common baseball card is not the same as being an average human being or an average player. And in fact, there probably isn't any such thing uh, for players to get to the major league level. When when you run into a story like this and your heart is playing, I mean, because I have I have this gigantic crate full of unknown baseball people. And the thing is, is that I guess yeah. maybe that's my connection to this book is the fact that maybe I need to do go into that and find out who they are. These total unknowns, because th those cards have got to be valuable to somebody just as much as Danny's card was valuable to you. Yeah. And, you know, it's it, there's the, the two values. There's the monetary value. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for instance, Danny O'Connell's card can be had for, let's say, average of about, about ten dollars for a decent card. But there are examples of this card uh, because they're in pristine condition that sell for thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, uh, for those of us who collected baseball cards in our youth, whether it was in the 50s or in the 80s or 90s, uh, there's a story behind each of those players. Uh, each of those guys wanted to play baseball. They loved baseball. They put a lot of work into it, and they really beat the odds to, to get to the highest level of baseball in the major leagues. And I'll give you a quick example, Errol, if I can. Danny O'Connell was born in 1929. There were 1.1 million American males born that year. Of that 1.1 million, 93 made it to the big leagues wow. for at least one day. Danny O'Connell played for 10 years. He was one of only 27 of that 1.1 million that played as long as a decade in the major leagues. So right there you see that uh, there's really no such thing as average if you're playing baseball at that level. I love his nickname. I, 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 I laughed out loud when I heard that he was called the head. I mean, I mean this, is, this, is, this chapter itself is all about true American history. Yeah, his, his boyhood was, was really something out of a, out of a novel. Uh, he was born at the start of the Great Depression mm -hmm. in Patterson, New Jersey. Grew up playing marbles, playing, you know, flipping baseball cards, uh, reading comic books, and playing baseball. And uh, his nickname was The Head because he was only, a, in, when he was in high school, he was about 5'2 and about 125 <laughs> pounds. But he was a very smart, he had one of those, you know, he was kind of a baseball or sports uh, genius in terms of knowing, you know, playing a step ahead, knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and making the most of what athletic ability he had. You know, at 5'2", though, all of, all of a sudden I just had a flashback of Yogi Berra. I've st I stood next to Yogi Berra, and here was this another a guy that was packed with lot, lots of dynamite in him, and he moved forward. What, what was the one thing that kept Danny from, from being that, that superstar, that guy in baseball? Was it his height? It, wait, he, it, no, it wasn't his height because he got to be 5'10". 511 okay. by the time he was uh, in his late teens it, he he was just good enough to to 
make it uh, in Major League Baseball. He was a good athlete. He was a good golfer. He was a good tennis player. He was good at a lot of things. Uh, he was a very good basketball player in high school, but he wasn't great. He wasn't the fastest guy. He wasn't uh, the quickest guy. Uh, he didn't have the the most power of you know swinging the bat, but he took what he had as a as an athlete, his athletic skills, and he combined that with his mental skills uh, on the baseball field in particular. And I'll give you a quick example. The last play that Danny O'Connell was involved in while wearing a major league uniform, he was in an old timers game and he pulled the hidden ball trick on a, a player <laughs> and made the last out for the last game. And that was the kind of ball player he was. That was the kind of thing he did on the, on the field. And Leo DeRocher, the famous manager, yes. once said of O'Connell that he, he, you have to watch out for that kid because he'll win more games with his brain than with his bat. <laughs> It's stories like this that we didn't get as fans, and that's why it's so important that we have people like yourself that are willing to do a story like this. Well, you know, you make a, that's a good point because I think as, as fans, we look up, we we idolize heroes. We idolize the Willie Mazes and the mm-hmm. Al Kalines and the Roberto Clementes. And, but we identify, I hope, more with the Danny O'Connells because on any any given team, there are... There's one Willie Mays and there's 24 Danny O'Connells. So I think we can we can identify with his his work ethic, his love of what he did, uh, his skills uh, in terms of what he what he accomplished. And uh, those of us who have other jobs, you know, if we can take that to to work every day, yeah, I think we're 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 pretty good. We're pretty good in life. I got to tell you, what I love about your book, and hopefully this doesn't make me look like I'm weird, but but when I read this book, I see a black and white world. And I, I don't know if it's because of the cover. I don't know if it's because a lot of my baseball cards as a kid were all black and white, but I, I, I see black and white. And I just I just envision myself up in those wooden stands, eating popcorn. There wasn't all the fancy food and things like that like we have now. But I just I just picture myself inside that stand, you know, hearing the story of this guy. You know, it's it's funny you say that because when I've gone back and read parts of the book, uh, I, I'm picturing it on black and white television. I'm yes. sitting in a you know a, a worn couch and watching a 25 inch screen uh, of black and white. Uh, uh, because I think that's because of the maybe the era that the book is focused on, which is the 1950s, and. Uh, that's where if you watch baseball on TV at all, you were watching it on a grainy <laughs> uh, black and white television set. <laughs> Whose idea was it to put the notes at the end of each chapter? Because, I mean, that to me gives me an opportunity to digest even more. It's like, OK, I just read the chapter. Now I can read these notes. Well, I, I've done that in several books. And the reason why is if you put the, the, the footnotes or the notes at the back of the book, they kind of get lost. Yep. And I'm also, I tend to be the kind of writer who gets excited about some little side alley <laughs> and uh, it, it doesn't fit in the text of the, of the chapter or the narration, but I just can't resist, you know, saying, hey, look what I found to the reader. So you put the notes at the back of the chapter and you can, for instance, in the first chapter of this book, there's a note at the end of the chapter that explains why it's 90 feet between the bases in baseball. Um, I could have put that in the chapter, but it slows the narrative, the narration down, so I put it in the notes. Wow. I would love to see the research on how many women or even teenage girls are going to read this book, because they, it, we are locked in a generation right now where the women in sports is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're going to want to know the true history of how we got here. Well, I, I hope it's I hope it's a lot. Uh, yes, yes, me too. Obviously, obviously, as the author, because it's also it's not just the you don't have to know a lot about baseball. I think to to get through the book, because it's also the story of the United States uh, from the period of just after World War II mm-hmm. to the early 1960s, and what was going on in, in America was reflected by what was going on in baseball, and vice versa. Um, so I, I hope that that that's in there as well. And I, I do focus a little bit on Danny O'Connell's wife and family because they were affected by what he did for a living too. He was away for long stretches of each season. Um, they had to move all the time when he got traded or changed teams. 
And uh, so there's that element as well uh, in the book. And as you said, there are more and more uh, women who are interested in baseball or mm-hmm. playing baseball or other sports. Let me ask you a question, only because I'm back to the, the the book cover again, and I, I, the the name O'Connell really kind of hit stays with my soul. Back in that time period, did he have an Irish accent? Because you know you don't get to hear the accents inside the pages. He didn't, and and his parents didn't. Apparently, wow. they he was from New Jersey, so they had a Jersey accent. <laughs> but he lived when he. When he was a kid, he lived with his grandfather, and his grandfather, even though he was born in America, did have an Irish accent. Okay. And his great grandfather was was off the boat from Ireland. So, uh, I don't think Danny uh, O'Connell himself had an Irish accent, but he was a Joysy <laughs> kid. So uh, he talked like he was from Joysy. <laughs> you got to come back to this show anytime in the future, Steve. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Earl. Will you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you.